Okay, so I guess I'll I'll get started. So the um, this was an open slot, so I, I had something that I've been looking into for the past couple of weeks, um, and so I thought I would talk about this. So this is um, this is not this isn't really my ordinary topic, um, but this is something that's been getting a lot of attention recently in. I guess psychology especially, but in, in the sciences, which is called the reproducibility crisis. So, I don't know, I assume, Jacob, did you know about this paper on redefining? Your paper? No, no, not my paper, the paper I'm talking oh, about. Um, I don't think I've read it, but I've definitely, yeah, I've heard many, yes, it's been discussed quite a bit. So yeah. This particular paper. About yeah. changing, the, changing the alpha level, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It's been discussed. Um, for a long time, or since this paper was brought out, this paper was yeah. from July. So Glenn I, has it. No, 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 I meant I meant really specific. I mean, people have been grumbling about non is testing for a number of years. Right. But you know, in the last even you know, two weeks, I've seen discussions of reviews of manuscripts um, that you know P equals 0.04 results weren't very convincing, and perhaps we should take up recent suggestions to uh, to alter the standard outcome. It wasn't, it wasn't clear to me that the you know, suggestions came from one source. Right, okay. Um, but it's sort of been really good. Right, okay. Well, yeah, so um, that's what I'll be talking about today. And there's been a lot of, so the, the, the brief history is that there was a paper that was titled Redefine Statistical Significance, which Glenn has a copy of there if you want to take a around, yeah. quick look at. I'll have some, uh, screen, 70 authors. I'll have uh, some screenshots of some of the arguments um, as we go through. And it's gotten a lot of attention because, well, mostly criticism um, based on some of the, well, I guess based on the proposal itself, which is to change the uh, default cutoff for statistical significance. Um, and what I'll be talking about isn't so much the proposal, but the argument that they give in support of the proposal, which I think is, uh, has, some, has some problems with it. Okay. Uh, so in this audience, Maybe I don't need to go through this so much, but this is the standard uh, notation for hypothesis testing. So the setting that we'll be talking about everything here is uh, just basic hypothesis testing. So we will consider testing a null hypothesis against an alternative, the, uh, and, would it, and uh, computing a p-value. The p-value is the probability under the null hypothesis of attaining a test statistic as extreme or more extreme than the one that was observed. And all of this is on the uh, on the handout, uh, so we can refer back to it as necessary. The key the key idea, though, is that uh, small p value correspond is, is interpreted as evidence against the null hypothesis, and the convention is to reject the null hypothesis and to declare the result as statistically significant if the um, if the p value is small, where uh, the small is determined by some predetermined threshold alpha and the point of contention is what that cutoff should be. So uh, the, the default cutoff in many fields is 0.05. That's been in place since Fisher. Um, I assume is that still the case? In, oh, in, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and so that's about 100 years old, right? Um, and other fields, genetics are much lower, physics are much lower, but uh, as I understand it, a lot of fields are still going by this 0.05 cutoff. And the significance of the cutoff is that it is thought to control the type 1 error rate because under the null hypothesis, the p-value is, so this is statistical theory, under the null hypothesis, the p-value is uniformly distributed on, on the unit interval. Therefore, the probability of obtaining a significant p-value when the null hypothesis is true is equal to alpha. Okay, so controlling, so Choosing this significance level is thought to control this type 1 error rate. And on the flip side, there is something called the type 2 error rate, which is the, uh, which is, um, the probability that we fail to reject the false null hypothesis. And the, and the, the, the trade-off is usually between type 1 error and power. So the power is, is the probability of rejecting a false null hypothesis. So we would like to reject false null hypothesis. We would not like to reject True null hypothesis. Okay, and the way that the uh, paper that I'm talking about evaluates the uh, the effectiveness of this of this procedure, um, 
on the whole. So we're thinking about, so this is a, these are statements about a, a single, probability statements about a single hypothesis test. But when we think about the literature as a whole, we're talking about a collection of p-values. And what we want to know is what, if you read a, if you were to come across a significant p-value in the literature, what's the chance that it's uh, a false positive or, or not? And so that's what, uh, that's what's uh, captured by the idea of the false positive rate, which is the proportion of all wrongly rejected null hypotheses. And I have, uh, this is equation one in the, in the handout is, is how this is usually calculated, which is just the proportion of false positives divided by the purport, divided by the total of all uh, rejected p-values, essentially. Okay. And the reproducibility crisis has to do with there are with with the fact that there are fewer uh, reproducible findings in the literature than the theory can explain. That's what I'm I'm calling the reproducibility crisis, roughly speaking. So if the theory could explain all of these, uh, all of the, the the lack of replication, then something like what's been suggested to lower the significance cutoff would uh, would work, or at least would uh, be the, would be the most uh, would seem like the most reasonable way to address the issue, I think. But the fact is that the, there is empirical evidence. Uh, there are these meta studies which show that the false positive rate is actually much higher than even the uh, theory itself um, would would suggest it should be, um, and that's why. Well, that's what's called. That's what the crisis is. Okay. Okay. So this is just is the false. The false positive rate is higher. False positive rate is higher than. So this is. So here's here's just a summary. So these are all the. These are the different possibilities. You have the null hypothesis being true, false, and we reject or not reject. And the proportion. So here I'm writing the prior odds. This is the proportion of false null hypotheses to true null hypotheses. So this is giving an idea of how, how many, what proportion of all of the hypotheses that are being tested in the whole community, scientific community, are true and false. So that affects, you know, that's a base rate of, uh, which determines how, how much of the literature should contain false positives. And the false positive rate is given by this ratio here. Um, for the purposes, so this, so I'll just explain this quickly. For the purposes of of, of, um, of this presentation, so we, it's really not possible to necessarily say whether something is going to be reproducible in the next. So reproducibility has to do with. Um, so you have a, you have a significant finding, and you'd like to test whether or not it stands up to additional testing. And so, uh, I guess the, the the most straightforward thing to do would be to repeat the repeat everything that the previous experiment, uh, which found the significant p-value, repeat everything that they did and, ca and do the same calculations. Um, and so, of course, in that case, there's a chance that you would end up with a false positive or that you would wrongly fail to reject. So I'm, I'm ignoring those possibilities just for the sake of discussion. And I'm assuming that if, so if a finding is true, then it would be replic then it is replicable. Uh, so this has so I, I'm not interested in whether or not it would be reproduced on the next try. I'm thinking of reproducibility as a as a property of the finding itself, not a property of the uh, scientist or the ability to actually detect detect the uh, the finding. Okay. And just correct yeah. so, the, so phi is is the center of the prior um, um, true effect or something. Yeah, so phi is the proportion of null hypotheses among all those tested that are true. Yeah, I mean, and we're distinguishing between published findings and all, all hypotheses, or is that a matter of um, So it wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily be published because the ones that are found to be, so it's, it's, it's hypothetically, I guess, uh, all those that are tested and I guess subject to publication ha had they checked out. I mean, this is what the this is essentially what they do in the paper. Um, if, did, did, if you want to look at it, I can give you a copy. Um, I mean, it's I just raise it. It's obviously, an issue about you know those spiral drawer problems and all this stuff. And yeah. If, uh, in, in, the, in the published literature, all non hypotheses are rejected. Um, 
Yeah. But that's obviously not that version. That extreme form is not what you're talking. About. So phi is not the proportion of rejected null hypotheses; right. the proportion of true null hypotheses, right? Yeah. No, no, but but I mean, there's a huge bias in, in, in because of the because of the issue of the, of the author threshold. There's a huge bias in favor of null hypotheses that the authors at least are arguing are should be rejected. Obviously, that's not the same as the underlying base rate. On the other hand, on the other hand, we have no access to the underlying base rate because we only have the published record. So that's the problem. Yes, yes. I, I mean, I agree with all of that, and that's part of. I think that's part of what I'll bring up, although it won't be quite that. It won't be quite that uh, detailed because I mean, these are. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, so you say that phi is all what again is all. Phi is a proportion of. So you have. Uh, Imagine all of the, the population of all hypotheses tests, right. hypotheses that are being tested. Phi is the proportion of those that are, of all, of all tested hypotheses that are true. Okay. 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 So, as I mentioned, this is the paper that I'm, that I'm talking, that, that this is the paper in question, the 72 author paper on, uh, and the, what's that? Ioannidis is one of the, uh, signed on to it, he's one of the authors, and he's very well known. Right. Yeah, so I mean, I agree that he's very well known. I'm surprised, I, although I'm still uh, surprised that anyone sat signed on to this, but we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, so, yes, you can see there are 72 oh, names. Many. And yeah, so there's a lot of well known uh, uh, statisticians. So there's, I guess, Jim Berger is one of the lead authors, and Ed George is the editor of the Annals of Statistics. I mean, Kennedy. Kenny Eastwarren Kenny is a Eastwarren. philosopher. Yeah, he'll he'll be here in in the spring. Yeah. P.J. Bachmacher is this, one of the best known Bayesian advocates in psychology statistics. Yeah, so we'll so come. I'm, I'm sure you'll come to this, but that's a peculiarity here. Is advocating for a change to non-hypothesis testing is is odd coming from a Bayesian who would rather do away. Yeah, so we'll we'll get so this is this is largely a Bayesian group from what I can gather. Um, Berger certainly is is Bayesian. Ed George is Bayesian, uh, and we'll get to Bagamakers because he plays into this uh, a bit more than maybe he should. Um, and this is the summary. So we propose to change the default p value from 0.05 to 0.005. Um, and here's, so before I go through the, I, I'm going to go through in some detail what they, what they say and why, and what they, how they back up their argument. So it's a very, it's a very short paper. Uh, half the paper is the author's list, the, the list of author's names. So we'll be able to go through uh, most of what they say here. Um, the, what, what they do is, I have to, I want to make clear, so their main proposal is to redefine the significance cutoff from 0.05 to 0.005, uh, and, and the reason they uh, argue for doing this is, as, you, as you'll see on the, uh, let's see, as you can see right here, the reason that they primarily argue for doing this is that they believe that a leading cause of non-reproducibility has not adequately been, been addressed, they think that the 0.05 level is um, just a, a, the standard of evidence set by the 0.05 level is too low, which I think is a reasonable uh, statement, but that they attribute that low standard of evidence as a leading cause of the reproducibility crisis, and then they say um, this simple step would immediately improve the reproducibility of scientific research in many fields. Okay, so so for me, the issue is not, and I want to make clear, the issue is not the proposal itself. Um, I'm not for or against the proposal. Um, I really don't, I, I guess I think it is kind of a distraction that we're talking about the cutoff at all. I think that, um, and as you just mentioned, that why are these, why is this particular group of authors talking about this? It seems to lend credibility to this concept in and of itself. But I'm not on either side of that. I'm more, uh, concerned or interested in the argument they actually use in, in support of this, uh, in, in support of the proposal. And so the key, the key uh, issue that I'll raise is that they, they, make, they make a comment which is that, I guess it's even on the first, it's in the first paragraph here, that associating statistically significant findings with 0.05 results in it, 
point with p less than 0.05 results in a high rate of false positives even in the absence of other other problems, and that's um, that's perhaps true, but that but that, that doesn't imply that when you so th this is giving kind of a best case scenario for things under the 0.05 level, which is if we ignore all of the reproduce all of the p hacking problems, even the best case under 0.05 is bad, and I'll show, I'll show you what they mean by bad in a second. But then they still ignore those additional issues when they argue for the benefits of the 0.005 of the new cutoff. But in effect, that's only saying what the best case scenario would be, and what I'll show is that when you actually take these, uh, this extra factor into account, uh, the benefits that they're claiming are, uh, are not quite uh, not quite what they claim them to be, okay? And so that's, that's the main issue. Um, and so we'll come to these uh, throughout, the, throughout, the, uh, throughout the slides. There are numerous other authors and other uh, critiques of this argument that I, will not re I won't really get into. Most of the arguments, though, that I've seen are not of a technical nature. So I'm, I'm, I'm more uh, focused on the technical flaws in the argument, which I think gets to some irony. Uh, but most of what most of what else, most of what else has been out there, a lot of what else has been out there, have, been, have raised a lot of valid points. But it's based on philosophical differences or you know uh, personal disagreements about how things should be done. But uh, the key the key issue that I'll I'll point I'll I'll raise here is that in order to make a statement such as reproducibility would immediately improve, so reproducibility the reproducibility crisis. Is, so false positive rate is a theory, you could think of as a theoretical calculation, you can calculate it in theory, but when you talk about the reproducibility crisis, this is a real world problem. And so when, when one goes to actually extrapolate the theory to the, to the real world, there has to be some accounting for what actually happens in the real world. And one key uh, issue of one, one key issue that's actually a primary uh, contributor to this uh, reproducibility problem is uh, what's known, what's called, what I'm going to call here p-hacking. So I don't know what scientists, how they just delineate between all of these various ways to get, I guess, invalid p-values. I'm just going to call all of those p-hacking. Okay. So I don't know if that's how. Well, it doesn't refer to any one specific behavior. Yeah. And I'm also not using p hacking in a negative way. I just, it's, I mean, I, I, well, no, I, well, I mean, just to say, I mean, you can, you, well, right. So I want to be clear. I don't, I'm not using it in a pejorative way. I mean, because you can get. I guess my point is that uh, I don't want to make. I don't want to claim that p hacking is always malicious or intentional. Right? It can be accidental, and in a lot of cases, very well may be. Um, it doesn't really matter. It still happens, and it still affects. Uh, what's going on? So that's another story. Um, okay. So, uh, Ken, uh, I'd really like you to tell us more about the uh, other critiques you said were okay. philosophical. Yeah, um, to... I'll get to that. Um, okay. Saying they're philosophical, I mean, they are philosophical. I mean, they don't get it. I mean, not all of them are. But they're, they, you can, you, they can, they divide in, in, in some ways along the. Uh, some of them are along Bayesian lines, some of them aren't, but I'll, I'll try to, uh, on, a, on a future slide, I have, I have a list of the titles at least to give you some indication. Okay, so here I already talked about this. Um, the key, the main points that I mentioned is that they say that the 0.05 level is a leading cause of reproducibility and changing the cutoff will. Do they document any, uh, what, how many, what fraction of the p-values reported are below 0.05 in any particular field? So there's no data. They do have some uh, empirical information uh, about this, and that's, and I'll, 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 I'll mention this. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so here I, I first want to just give some due to what, where they come up with this 0.005 uh, level. So, I mean, what they probably do is they added it, they just added a zero, right, <laughs> to the 0.05 level. But, what, but how they argue is through uh, Bayes factors, so like I, like I guess was pointed out, this is largely a Bayesian group um, of authors. And so under various, I guess, under different ways of calculating the Bayes factor. So the Bayes factor, this is the calculation they're going off of, which is the 
ratio of the probability of the alternative hypothesis, conditional probability of the alternative hypothesis given the observation, given the data, to the probability of the null hypothesis. So this is a Bayesian concept that the uh, hypotheses themselves have probabilities assigned to them. And you can break it down into a base factor times the prior odds. Okay. So the prior odds, that is the phi, the 1 minus phi over phi that I, that I mentioned uh, on an earlier slide. That's the ratio of false to true null hypotheses. And what they show is, that, well, one thing they, they do say is that there's no, there's no direct uh, link between base factors and p-values, but um, if you do some calculations under some assumptions, the 0.05 level corresponds roughly to a base factor of between 2.5 and 3.5, and, and the 0.005 is a base factor between 14 and 27, 14 and 26 or so. And in the Bayesian literature, they say that it, by Bayesian standards, this is considered to be strong or substantial evidence. Um, so is that true, would you say? Yeah, well, the, from Jeffrey's list of categories of base factors. So that's from, that's from Jeffrey's. That's from Jeffrey's. Okay. Well, it's not specifically those numbers. Those numbers come from the plot. Yeah. No, no, I know, I know. But these, these characterizations, or I, I guess I'm... Uh, yeah, I think the wording is originally Jeffrey's. It was something like tan greater is decisive. Maybe it's not the same words, but it's like decisive versus strong versus suggestive. Or the category is down from the top. Okay, so that's, that's how they come up with this 0.05 suggestion. Okay, and this, so this is certainly, this is a debatable point, uh, not, not that I want to, but I don't want to debate it. It's just that uh, many people certainly have. Uh, so. I think uh, Deborah Mayo has been involved in this discussion, uh, as you, and as you might expect, she's not uh, particularly enamored with the Bayesian perspective. Uh, there's also a debate of, you know, this is this is giving the Bayesian view precedence over the frequentist view, and so, of course, that's that's one view that one can take, but it's not a given that one would want to do that or that one ought to do that, right? Uh, but I'm not, that's not a concern of mine. Uh, my issue is about the, is not, as I've said, my issue is not about this, this level. I'm going to take it as given. Okay. okay. And so here where they go on to get these numbers, Glenn, you said. Uh, so here they do some calculations of the, so comparing what the false positive rate would be. So the false positive rate was, again, just this ratio here. So what this false positive rate would be as a function of power under different combinations of the prior odds and the two different significance cutoff levels. And so what they write is that, um, so this might be unsettling. The, uh, for example, the false positive rate is greater than 33%. They're talking about this red dotted line here. It's greater than 33% at all levels of power uh, at a threshold of 0.05. Um, and they say that reducing the threshold to 0 0.005 would drop it as low as 5%. And uh, you can see, in fact, that the, the improvement is substantial. So they uh, offer that as an argument in favor of the lower significance level. Okay. And so this will be a point that I'll, that I'll come back to. Okay. But this is, this is the first an argument that false positive rates will fall if, if we lower the significance cutoff. And they also make an argument that replication rates will double or approximately double based on empirical evidence. So there have been recent uh, studies in psychology and there's also one in, in experimental economics to uh, try to reproduce uh, studies that have, that have been published. And the one with the bigger, uh, the one with the bigger sample sizes from psychology which actually I think is a sample size of 97. That's about 100 studies. And what they found was that in those studies, I think 36 or 37 percent of the findings were replicable. The ones that were, had a p-value less than 0.05 were reproduced in the next trial. Are you familiar with this one? Yeah. This, yeah. Okay. Well, it got a lot of attention. It's not just a random sample of studies. It's really yeah. famous results. Yeah. And an incredible fraction of them not replicable. Okay, so 37 percent, right? 37 percent replicated. That's it was it was between 36 and 40 percent, but I think it was 37 uh, percent. But the way that they argue about reproducibility of the 
0.005 results versus 0.05 is that they, you can look into those, uh, the p-values that they actually studied up in, those, in those findings, and what they found was, um, so they looked at, so this is 0.05, 0.005. And so if the original p-value was lower than 0.05, they found that 50% of those, those findings were reproducible. The ones that were in between 0.00 in the intermediate range, only 24% of those were reproducible. Do you have anything? Uh, my question was how many, um, how many are, what fraction of those are below 0.05? Right. So they do suggest, um, I don't know if they wrote it up here, so empirical evidence do provide insights into the prior odds. Uh, I don't know if it's in this paragraph, but uh, in, in psychology, they, they said that the prior odds, uh, the, no, the estimate is one in, one in 10. That's not my question either. My question was, given Pat, how many of the, of course here you're looking at the famous papers, I understand. Yeah. But how many of those famous papers were below uh, a half of 1% and how many were below? Between, you don't have those numbers up there. Oh, I see. And how many were between? Uh, well, I don't know. All I know is what's in this study, which is ninety. There's ninety-seven. Um, there's ninety-seven study. There's ninety-seven, and I can look at how many of those were below 0.05 because I do have that, but I don't have it uh, here. Yeah. But I mean, that. Would, sorry, one question is. Um, 47 of those were less than 0.005. So half of them. Yeah. So, and those were the famous ones. What are those that you say? Well, the whole group of things, so they're all famous. They're all equal things. So but I'm not sure how to compare the famous But I wonder, <laughs> no, I guess if you took, if you took the exist, the things that are coming out of the top journals now, yeah. and you say, okay, take out the ones that are not below 0.05, how many would disappear? Would half of them disappear? Or, or three-fourths of them disappear? Uh, it's hard to say. It's very field dependent. Very field dependent, but it would be interesting to know in a few fields what the answer was. Uh, yeah, so, so your, your view is that, uh, I, I guess where you're going is that we wouldn't, those papers wouldn't have not been there. They would have found some way to get the p-value down. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's, that's right. Um, yeah. I guess, I, 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 I think, well, I guess what I should say, I've talked to, I think a lot of people do at least think that that's very plausible, right? I mean, I don't know. Uh, depend. I mean, uh, but regardless, um, you have to at least consider that possibility. Right? Um, so we'll 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 uh, we'll see. We'll, we can talk about how uh, how many of those papers. So some of them probably wouldn't have made it, and some pro and some probably would. But they're assuming that all of them that are in this intermediate range. Wouldn't make it. If they um, wouldn't make it, then we're talking about half as many papers in those journals. The editors would have a problem right. too. Right. Yeah. Which uh, wouldn't be a bad thing, right? <laughs> probably, uh, yeah, they'd, have, they'd fill the space somehow, I guess. Um, so, yeah. Know, yeah. What is p value for physics experiments, for example? It's probably like, is it 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 8th? Or, it's very, it's very, very low. Yeah. And I, I think there is no reducibility crisis there given the range of experiments that we produced? Well, I, I wouldn't know this, but not not that I know of, but I, I, I but I don't know. So I know that in, in genetics, the cutoff is five times 10 to the minus six or so. Do you, do you have any idea? Yes. So, but that that's more has to do with the, the, with that, a lot of that has to do with the, in genetics, the multiple, multiple testing problem, which is that, um, and that does seem to work, at least, because they're testing so many hypotheses, they have to have a lower cutoff. Um, but in physics, I, I don't know of there being right. such a such so a problem. Well, there has been a problem. Was that? There has been a problem in physics. We produce those, but not nearly the same magnitude. Uh -huh. I mean, there are cases of fraud. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's kind of it's not universal. Not, oh, not in this. Not, but it's it's not unrelated. I mean, the problem is not a statistical right. problem, but it's not unrelated because, at least as it's perceived in psychology, a lot of the reproducibility crisis has to do with uh, un. un desirable pressure on the scientists to find amazing results that will make the New York Times. And that leads to the p-hacking behaviors that you're alluding to, um, putting them aside the mathematics of it. And that, that pressure certainly applies in physics and chemistry as well. 
Well, I think the math is, is irrelevant to the, I mean, to, to, the, to the discussions in a lot of ways. I mean, the, the math is, is what we see, but what's causing the issue? So the, what the, 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 the proposal that's in place here is a purely mathematical argument based on, you know, suggesting that this is what's going to improve things, right? right. But that kind of misses a lot of what's, I, I mean, I would think, I, at least I'm not in this field, right? But I would think that the major, the major cause is, is, is the stuff that you're alluding to. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't think you've gotten to the bulk of the argument, so I, I want to wait and see, but I mean, just a priori, prima facie, it seems very plausible that uh, a more severe uh, alpha cutoff would improve the situation because because the pressures are very non-mathematical. Right? But when you have when you have a lab that wants to publish a result of a certain kind, a, a, a p equals 0.05 threshold is relatively easy to accidentally attain. Mm -hmm. So you run a study and it doesn't come out the way you want. So you run another study and after a few studies, you get one that works and then you publish. And if you have p equals 0.005 you could certainly follow the same procedure, and there might be even more pressure to follow it, but it would take more dummy studies before you accidentally hit on one. That was significant, and, and so it would be harder to feedback. That's the, that's the prima facie argument. Oh, I have no doubt that it's harder, but that their that's part of their argument. But I mean, the, the, but the question of whether it's harder doesn't does not speak to whether it will actually improve reproducibility. Because you know, if, if you just have to work harder, that doesn't change what actually appears in the journal. No, that's right. I mean, so I mean, that's a question. That's, a question. That's, that's certainly part of the argument. I wasn't sure. So it's certainly possible that people could simply redouble their efforts to VHAC or multiply it by right. ten until they could do just as much damage as is currently being done. But that would take a lot of effort. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how much. More effort. It depends on the right. Time. I mean, I also don't know how. Do more study time. Yeah. I mean. There's only so many studies you can run. Right. Even a very ambitious right. researcher with dubious ethics gives up. So, but I mean, I guess I'm not. I guess one question, which is probably not known, is how hard these people are already working, and yeah. uh, and also, I mean, I guess if they're, um, I mean, if if you're not already kind of, well, let's let me just, if you're not already kind of say good enough or not trying to do things the right way and you're struggling to get to 0.05, what chance do you have to make it at, you know, it, to 0.005 by an honest uh, method if you're already struggling to get to 0.05? I mean, uh, Doesn't that go the other way? I'm sorry. It's, it's, if you could barely make it to 0.05, then it would be very hard to cheat at the 0.005. I'm saying if you can't make it to 0.05 honestly, right, then I guess it's not like you're going to just give up. I mean, I, I wouldn't think that you would just give up. Uh, because you said this this is too hard to achieve. I mean, maybe some would. Yeah, well, I think it's an open yeah. question. I mean, I'm not. I mean, wouldn't there be kind of a cross field kind of argument, looking at different choice of p values in different fields, and look at how bad the crisis is in different fields, like given a horizontal comparison? As of now, I don't think. I mean, the only studies I know of are the one in economics and the one in psychology. And the one in economics only studies uh, 16. But that's a very small sample size. But there, the reproducibility was uh, something like 60% overall or something. So it was better. But it's such a small sample size, it's hard to say. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come to this. By the way, I mean, I'm not, I, you said uh, to get to the crux of their argument, this, this, is, the, this is their argument. I mean, that's, that's it. So um, that, that's what they've given. Um, here, just to get to Glenn's point, I, I'll also just make this comment that they have seem to take it on, I mean, part of, the, I mean, there is a bit of a mob mentality uh, in the 72 author paper, but also in the second, I think this is the second paragraph, that they argue, that they do state that there is a critical mass of researchers who endorse the change that they're proposing. And it, it's not clear exactly what that critical mass is. Maybe it's the 72 authors on the paper, but there have been several responses and much more kind of non-informal responses, but you can see this one has 88 authors, this one has 50 authors. So there's actually, uh, at least as of now, more people who have written uh, in criticism of this than, than in support. And, and actually, I haven't really seen any real strong support from anyone who what isn't among the authors on the, on the paper. Um, so, so can, I mean, I haven't read these responses. Yeah. So, so I can give you a quick rundown. The ones who say remove um, or can't fix the problem this way, are they 
for Bayesian sort of base factors instead of Greenland. So go ahead. So Greenland, um, is he, I, I think he is, he, he probably is Bayesian. Um, but I don't know. So this is a very short comment, and all they all they more or less say is that uh, one, one way to say is that you know this doesn't really help help matters because part of the issue itself is the kind of dichotomization of of, of findings. And so uh, I guess just to kind of somewhat quote what they said is that they do give them credit here because I guess I, well, something that I, I, I is a bit too it's not clear exactly what the implication of this is. So one thing I should note is that they don't suggest to reject findings. So under this new proposal, they're not suggesting to reject findings in this range. They're not suggesting to accept them either. I mean, they're not really making publication uh, recommendations. But they're, they're suggesting to call things in here significant and things in here suggestive. Um, and you know, what, what, uh, whether that's. So it's not, they're not even saying don't publish it. They're not saying don't publish it, but that doesn't mean that, so it seems unlikely to me that once you start to call things by a different name that actually people say, well, we'll still publish it. Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? There's too many variables, I think, in play. But uh, what they, so they do say that, so this, uh, this gets from a dichotomization to a trichotomization, which I guess is a step in the right direction according to them. But they say that, you know, we should just get rid of this, this idea of, of uh, of statistical significance, I guess uh, I, I don't know. I don't want to put words in their mouth, but uh, I mean, they don't say that. Whether they, uh, I, I would assume that if they, if you were to report a p-value, you would just report it. There would be no kind of significance or not. Um, but overall, I think that they are against this dogmatic view of, well, trying to impose anything on what you should or what you ought to do. Uh, I think is, is one thing. That, is one thing that I gathered through. Emails, I guess, from with both of them. I guess they, they both e emailed me about this uh, back and forth. So, um, this here is, uh, and I'll quote this on the next slide. Um, they say don't have a don't have a cutoff either way. That, that whoever is publishing. So this is just a rough summary. So um, wh whatever you're publishing, I guess whoever. Uh, so instead of having a fixed threshold that everybody follows. The authors of the paper can set their own, should set their own uh, significance level, and they should justify that in their analysis. Um, but let's go quickly through this. Um, so actually, actually, can I interject? One? Yeah. So, so the, the term suggestive, I don't know if this is obvious or not, but the term suggestive, they didn't make it up. I mean, that's a word that's commonly used in psychology okay. for marginal results, or what we call marginal results. Uh -huh. I mean, Results that, that miss the people's 0.05 threshold, but don't miss it by very much. And therefore, if you're not a strict traditionalist, you, you take as, as some evidence in, in favor of the alternative, or some evidence against the no, uh, but not but not to the to the threshold of professional significance. But you know, close enough that it would be pedantic to insist on difference. So if someone's at 0.06, people will say it's suggestive evidence that. Mm -hmm. And so they're they're basically suggesting to move up the two right. respects. And what the, so how does suggestive get treated? Uh, Good question. I mean, you probably can't hinge your whole paper on the suggestive result, but if there are side effects that are interesting and uh, you would be nice to tell a story about, but they are not the main story, then you can you can tell your story if it's connected to a p equals 0.06 or 0.07. Or something. Yes. Um, this one I don't know the specifics of what's in this. I'll just mention that the lead author here is the editor of this journal, Basic and Applied Social Psychology, which is one of the editors, uh, which in the past couple of years made some news because they have banned p-values. Do you know about this? No. Um, so there, this is a journal in social psychology. Because they banned the use of p-values in anything associated to the null hypothesis significance testing paradigm. And, um, and what do you do instead? They don't say. Oh well, uh, no. I think confidence intervals are associated to. Uh, um, so they are open to Bayesian, uh, but I think that they they, I think that they argue that you should justify what you're doing, uh, more or less. Uh, but there, there is another option that was introduced in psychology about ten years ago called P-Rep. No, I don't know. I heard of it, but it doesn't make much difference. It didn't it didn't sail through the, the critics. But P-Rep is supposed to be an estimate of the probability of replication. So if you have a result, that is a result that's highly significant, 
is more likely to be replicated. And one, one mathematician essentially made an argument about how you could convert the, the significance value. There's no Bayesian argument whatsoever, just how you could convert the significance level to the probability of replication. In other words, if the same experiment were done again, what proportion of the time would you get another significant finding? But it was like a simple formula. Yeah, it was a one, and, it was a one line formula. And it didn't make it look much worse. So it was sort of based on no assumption of no p hacking, essentially. Yeah, no, it's definitely based on assumption of no p hacking. Right. But one journal briefly insisted that all authors use p hacking. And then other mathematicians came along and said, it makes no sense. And it has all kinds of negative consequences, not dissimilar to your argument. In, in I see. Today, as far as I know. But, OK. But it, the argument that they made against it was just a kind of common, a common sense argument? They, they kind of no, used no, head some, data? No, there was some simulation. But, but okay. it, the argument against it was basically for Bayesians, who said this doesn't really solve the underlying problem with right. non classes testing. Nice. Um, this one is interesting. This is Gellman uh, involved in this. So abandoned statistical significance, um, which is that, which is just that it shouldn't have a privileged role in finding in scientific findings. You can use p values, uh, but there shouldn't be this cutoff of significance. You can also use other things to come to your uh, come to your findings, this is just an argument that, we, that maybe there should be an emphasis on things other than statistical significance, like better better study designs, better things like, all things like that, so. Um, okay. Okay, so this is a comment from, this is, this is just a, uh, a quote from this Justify Your Alpha paper, and I, I only highlight this because of some of the things that are, that are, you probably can't even see that I've highlighted some of these, these sentences, but some of these things is, is, are directly relevant to what I'll be talking about in my argument. So they, they throw it out there, for example, that um, however, it's difficult to predict how much, I think this is just false positive rate, um, how much false positive rate will change in practice. So they say that um, all else being equal, we agree that the improvement will happen in theory, uh, but it's hard to predict what will happen in practice because Quantifying this uh, requires accurate estimates of several unknowns, which includes the prior odds, it includes the true power, and it also includes the change in actual behavior of researchers should the newly proposed threshold be put into place. Um, so they, they did raise this point, um, but they, they, they didn't do an analysis of anything of what might actually be the implications of that. Um, so I think that there's a lot of uh, kind of common sense that these are, these are things that should be considered, but. Um, they go on to then make their, their other proposal. Okay. Um, they also say, they argue that there's insufficient evidence that this is in fact, that this standard is a leading cause of non-reproducibility. The arguments in favor are not strong enough and the lower significance threshold will have full likely positive negative consequences. So those are relatively, these last two are relatively uh, generic in that um, they're, I guess, and, and they're easy to say these things, but uh, they also do, do seem to make sense. Okay, so I want to go, th I'll just go through um, what, so what's the difference? So my, the difference that I, I'll highlight is that this, this picture doesn't account for any kind, as, as we've alluded, this doesn't account for any kind of p-hacking or any departure from the theory. This is the theory, right? Uh, so this, this, this is the theory and this is uh, what they, what they uh, argued for why reducing, so here this is the, this is the prior odds of one tenth at the level of 80% power, which is the standard uh, convention, I guess, as a conventional uh, target, I think. Power. Then at this level, we drop from about 35% to, I think it's about 0.06 at this level. So, you know, in any case, the, the drop is significant. Um, and so if we were to if we were to make this change, then we would immediately improve. The false positive rate would drop from being over 33 percent, which, which you know, they say nobody should, nobody would ever think that's a good good thing, uh, to under 10 percent, which is a lot better. But as I mentioned, so as as you've already realized that. Uh, they're using the theory, so I, I guess th there's this there's a difference between calculating something in theory and using a mathematical argument and actually trying to use that theory to make a claim about what would actually happen in practice when 
the reason you're doing these calculations in the first place is because what's happening in practice is not what the theory predicts, right? I mean, the, 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 um, if there weren't a reproducibility crisis, then they probably wouldn't be making these, writing this paper. Right? Um, so they, they completely ignore kind of what's causing the issue and what's actually causing them to make this recommendation, which is the fact that uh, there is, um, there are kind of unexplained and systematic departures from what the theory prescribes. Okay. And so for, for our purpose, so what I want to do is I want to try to incorporate some account, I want to account for p-hacking somehow in this calculation. Okay. And I'm going to do it in a very straightforward way. So for my, for my purposes, uh, p-hacking is just any p-value, well p-hacking is anything that gives me a p-value that doesn't that can't be interpreted the way it's supposed to be interpreted. Okay. So the, the interpretation of a p-value is uh, p-value is supposed to be interpreted as the probability under the null hypothesis that the st test statistic is as extreme or more extreme as what, what we've observed, of observing a test statistic as extreme or more extreme than what we observed. And a hacked p-value is just one that doesn't have that interpretation. Okay. And so that's, um, that's the key issue uh, that we'll highlight here. So the key difference, um, key difference that to kind of realize is that in the theory the alpha is the type 1 error rate. This is the probability of fault wrongly rejecting the null hypothesis. But in practice alpha is the cutoff for statistical significance. It's the cutoff for getting published. Okay, and there's a difference between these two things. Um, and we'll come so back. you had something about Goodhart's law on your first slide, but you didn't. We'll get to this in two slides I'll, I'll mention. Okay. So, okay. So there is a there is a depart there is a difference between the alpha level as it's intended and what it would actually uh, manifest in the data as we know because the false positive rates are higher than they're supposed to, higher than the theory would uh, so, predict. Just yeah. Paraphrase. So, so alpha would be the would be what it's supposed to be if everybody published everything and there was no no barrier to publication whatsoever and then some. Probability of some some fraction of the of the rejected um, null hypothesis would actually be true, and uh, alpha. And the, the theory would follow um, the practice would follow the theory, putting other factors aside. If there were, if everybody just published every step, but that's not even remotely the case because it's actually the barrier to publication. Right, um, but if if you only published um, significant results. But they were all. But you always got. Uh, but you always followed the theory to the letter, and you always got your p-values always met what they're supposed to mean. Then wouldn't alpha still? Well, you're talking, you're talking about the false, false error rate. So. Well, I guess it's So I guess for our for for me maybe the, really I guess the the significance of alpha maybe is how it factors into this calculation, but. Yeah, um, let's see. I, 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 what I mean is that the, the question that I then asked before, what is the distribution of actual published p-values? That would be very different if, if alpha 0.05 were, were not the threshold for publication. We'd have p-values all over the map. But instead, we have p-values that are highly biased to only be less than 0.5. I and mean, that's obvious. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the difference between those two lines at the bottom. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's at least one of the differences. At least one yeah, 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 right. yeah. Okay. Um, so now we, so all we have to do is that we, we, if we distinguish between these two different types of p values, there's some proportion of p values that are obtained by p hacking, and there's some proportion that's not. So the question is, how many are hacked? I mean, I, I, I don't know if there's any estimates out. I'm going to produce an estimate here. I don't know how. I can't verify whether it's it's good or bad, but Using using the calculations, I can match match it up to what's observed and get an estimate for it. Uh, but there is some proportion of p values out there that are hacked. Is it significant enough to? Are there any that aren't? Yeah. <laughs> well, I okay. have seen numbers actually for. You know, there have been surveys of of scientists in the field asking what what uh, how many uh, times have you done the following practices, ranging from mildly yeah I saw this um, yeah. improper practices to extremely improper. 
I mean, I don't know how honest the survey, you know, the survey respondents are. But, but I mean, almost everybody has done something that technically violates the, the assumptions of the theory, but not necessarily by very much. Right, yeah. So, I mean, of course, not all, not all p hacking is, is e or created equal, right? But, um, okay, but I, I'm going to assume there's some proportion. It's probably higher than, as you just said, it's. Depending how strict you want to be, it's probably everything. But you know, regardless, let's assume these are so. There's some so, some uh, proportion H, and I'm going to assume, for the sake of simplicity, that there's some fixed baseline uh, significance level, which for our purposes is 0.05, and that every hacked p-value is significant uh, at that level when the when the significance cutoff is out. So I mean, if, if if you tried to hack a p uh, hack a p value and you got to something that wasn't significant, I mean, is it actually has it actually been hacked? I guess that's a it's a fil little bit of philosophy for it. Okay. So, all right. And the remaining proportion follow the uh, the standard theory. So now we have a breakdown of three. So three different um, possible. So the proportions of these different p values that are significant follow these. Uh, can be calculated in this way, and the table expands to include. Um, oh, I also assume that you only do p hacking when the null hypothesis is true, because if you were, if I mean, I don't necessarily even understand, buy into the concept of uh, the hypothesis being true of its own merits. But uh, assuming that this is a, this is a meaningful concept, um, if the if the null hypothesis were false and you p hacked. Well, you actually got something that was true, so it's not actually going to be detectable uh, because that's going to be a replicable result uh, under under the under the, under my assumption. Uh, so I only assume that p hacking affects true null hypotheses, and and here all that happens is that we have some additional break off of some proportion that are um, hacked, and the rest follow exactly the calculation. The proportion one minus h follows the calculation as before, and the false positive rate is now just uh, amended with this additional uh, proportion H. And so the this, it makes clear that how the calculations in the RSS, that's the redefined statistical significance uh, proposal, implicitly ignore p-hacking because they're implicitly setting this H to be zero when they calculate false positive rate. Intuitively, it doesn't sound like they're assuming it's zero. They're assuming it's not a function of the, of the alpha. I mean, you, you alluded to that in the previous slide that, you know, that, uh, I don't know if express it this way, but that the H is, is fixed at a certain alpha level, but the, uh, so I'm, so no, so I'm assuming that H, I'm, I'm, so I'm assuming that H, the only dependence of H on the alpha level right now is that I want to assume that the entire proportion is significant at level alpha. I don't want to assume there's kind of waste. Um, and I'm going to assume that H is fixed. Okay. So I'm assuming that alpha is um, 0.05, the beta, the alpha is 0.05, and that there is some proportion H that is therapy. Um, and that H will be the same when I change the cutoff to 0.005. The question is what, how much of this proportion will continue to come below the lower cutoff? So well, H is less than alpha by that, by what you're doing there? What's that? Is H less than alpha? H has nothing to do, no. Well, H doesn't have to be less than alpha or bigger than alpha. H is the proportion. So you have some, some, you have a bunch of tests. You have a bunch of hypotheses. Some are following, some are applying the theory as it appears in the textbook. That's proportion one minus H. And H, some proportion H, say 10% are doing whatever they can to get below the significance cutoff. And so H is just a, a fact of the community or the, the population of hypotheses that are being tested. Okay. okay. Yeah. So let me try to restate my point because I think this I think this is a point strongly in your favor and it goes to the heart of your argument. So so on your third bullet there you have um, right. so alpha is let's say fixed at point of five and there's some proportion of H in the current population. And there the the 80 author paper, the, the paper in question argues that if we change the alpha level, there would be some consequences which disregard the consequent change in H. But, your, but 
your argument, one of your arguments is that if we change the alpha level, if people still want PHAC, they will they will have to change H to compensate. And it could lead to more PHACing because it is now more difficult to get published. It very well may. Yeah, and if, yeah, I, I think very logical. You know, I think that's actually right. I, I didn't so I'll show you so that's not Right now, no. Right now, I'm not considering changing alpha yet. So when I change when I change alpha, there will be there will be that consideration. Although I won't entertain the possibility that H increases just to be conservative, but I think that it, I think that it absolutely would. Um, okay. So this is the new picture, and now what I want to compare is this is their this is their graph. I'm looking at the red plot because I, I just take the prior odds to be one tenth just for to be simple. So these two bottom solid lines are exactly these two red lines here. That's where h is equal to zero. These two lines, so this is h equals zero, this is the 0.005, this, oh no, this is 0.05, this is 0.005. And the, so the higher is always the current cutoff, the lower is the new cutoff. This is when h is 5% and this is when h is 15%. So based on my um, calculate, my comparison of this figure, to the replication project in psychology, I estimated H to be somewhere between five and 15%. Um, so I actually estimated, the point estimate was seven and a half percent, and then if I play around with some other numbers, you get somewhere between five and 15%. I don't want to claim that these are good estimates, right, but this is just a ballpark for the sake of the study. So what you can see is that uh, the, 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 the false positive rate is not 33%, Currently, it's well. It's somewhere. It's actually somewhere like uh, sixty percent. But um, if you count account for p hacking, it's it's somewhere between here and here currently. And, it, and if if you drop the significance level to uh, 0.005 and the level H stays the same, okay. For now, I'm assuming that it stays the same, so that any hacked p value of 0.05 continues. Okay. So we have to entertain the possibility that some will die out then this is the drop, so this is the improvement. So you're not getting this six times improvement, you're getting a much more, a much smaller improvement, and you're improving to something that's actually worse than what the theory currently tells you you're at. So your impression of what you're improving to is, is maybe a bit off by looking at, at what they're suggesting here. Okay. So that's the um, first observation, is just that the false positive rate would not drop as precipitously as they're claiming. I mean, it, it, because this is this is assuming things that just aren't real. Where it, how how far will drop? I mean, it could be. I mean, you could end up going from something like seventy-five percent to seventy-one percent of false positive rate. I mean, that's maybe a bit extreme, but it's it's not quite a. It's not a very. It's not even a noticeable improvement in practice. Okay, so here's good hearts. So Goodhart's law is, is, is the issue with, uh, so this is from economics. This is Goodhart was an economist in 1975, which uh, I think applies very well here, which is just that if you, the, the alpha is supposed to be a measure of the type error, the type one error rate, um, but it has turned into the target for publication or for significance. And so obviously, uh, so at this point, so when, it, when the measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And this is where I want to consider what's going to happen when we um, lower the cutoff. So the key, the, the point that you just made, and I think that this is the point that this is the point that they that they ignore is that you know p values are so in this case. So they're making the assumption that p values are hacked specifically to achieve this 0.05 level, but they're not hacked to achieve 0.05 level. They're hacked to achieve statistical significance, which happens to be 0.05 right now. And so once the cutoff changes, the target will change. And quite likely, in, in a lot of cases, so will the p-value. Uh, so it's a question of how, how much it changes by. Um, but empirical evidence, so this is, th these are, so this was the, um, so do you know this is a p-curve? Uh, and this, I, I actually, th this is where I'm being pointed to for the study. There's probably others uh, that I don't know about. But, what they find is that in the, the distribution of p-values in the literature is that there are, there are many more p-values that lie just below 0.05 than you would expect uh, according to the theory. Okay. And so this, there's, there's a variety of reasons for this. One is the, there, there's obviously publication bias. Another is that 
Well, if you were p-hacking, then uh, you're, you're shooting for 0.05 once you get there. Uh, if I get to 0.045, 0.048, um, oh, do I, uh, you know, do I continue trying to get to get any better? I have no real incentive to do that. Um, okay, so that's what they find. I guess I turned them on. And so, by 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 the calculation, you know, under the sound theory. So if we if we calculated a p value uh, according to the theory, then the, the the theory is independent of the policy for publication, and so the p value would actually not change under the uh, under the new uh, cutoff, but we would expect, at least in some cases, and I think probably in a lot of cases, that these hacked p-values will, will decrease. And the question then is, so let's assume this is at the alpha 0.05 level. So this is what's happening at the 0.05 level. And let's suppose these are the hacked p-values. The question is, uh, what happens to these uh, once the cutoff changes? Okay, so it's a bit... Um, Optimistic to assume they would not change. Most certainly they wouldn't. The uh, question is whether they can successfully be brought below. And so that gets to your question that it certainly is harder to achieve well, significance. Uh, let me amend that. Actually. It depends on what, what method you're using to p-hack, right? So, I mean, you alluded to this before and talked about, talked about no p-hacking is, is alike. But that's, I mean, that's understated. You know? there, there are, broadly speaking, there are two methods of p-hacking, very broadly speaking. One is to fake your data. And that is clearly no harder to do with a new alpha level than it was with the old alpha level. Um, but I, I guess the assumption, maybe tacit assumption behind the RSS paper is that is that a lot of p-hacking is a sort of more slightly more benign kind where people won't actually fake any data, but they will throw the dice over and over again, for example. And uh, that means there are probably many other ways of doing this. But play, play with the factors or simply repeat the experiment until you get the result that you want. And, and that presumably really is harder. So your arrow there, it's going to be very hard to, yeah. to, to hack a 0.06 result to, to 0.004 than it would yeah. to be to 0.004. Sure. I guess um, I'm just tacitly assuming that. that so, is so the question is, so are the, would those be two, um, are those two extreme cases, would you say? I mean, those, those are the most extreme that I can come up with. Yeah, so the, 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 the case that I'm thinking is maybe somewhere in the middle, where you right. have data from a given, I guess I guess if you if you run experiments for it, I don't know how people necessarily run experiments, right? But you're supposed, I guess, do you state the hypothesis before the experiment, you run the experiment, if, the, if that hypothesis either is validated or not, and then you move on? Or do you continue with that data to test other hypotheses? You throw in different covariates, you consider different models, yeah. right? Yeah, something closer to this. And so there you don't have to run a new study to continue to try different things. Oh. Um, no. Well, wait, if you want to add covariates, you have to run this. Well, let's, no, I'm saying to con to consider whether these covariates are, were, or yeah, whether you're doing experimental work or working from databases. Right, I'm talking about experimental work, so, so a lot of this, yeah. So, but, but if you have, I mean, I guess, I, I mean, I, I don't know, if you are collecting, uh, even in an experiment, so when you uh, go and, and go to analyze the data afterwards, did you do you have a model in mind beforehand, and then you just use that, or do you kind of fiddle with different things that? I mean, you know, in a lot of, a lot of psychology, we don't have what you would consider a model. <laughs> okay. We have a hypothesis, usually in the form some factor makes a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's why all this kind of traditional um, tripe of how to that null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis is always framed around no difference versus some difference, because usually the models are barely any more sophisticated than that. Some factor I think matters. And so if I include it in my experiment, I'll find a difference between this group and that group between this condition and that condition. Mm -hmm. And if I don't find any difference, then I'm the typical thing, and I'm, I'm partly talking about my own luck thinking, but I think this is sort of an exaggerated version of this happens in people who p hack, is that they don't find a difference, so they still kind of believe there should be a difference. They think, well, there's something wrong with the method. We're not getting sensitive, we're not getting honest mm -hmm. answers from other subjects, we're not getting enough data. So, so it's just rerunning with some minor thing changed or maybe some other thing changed to make it, um, you know, to increase the power, essentially. To, uh, to, but to increase the power, do something that is legitimately improved the experiment, but also has the effect of simply rerunning the experiment. And then you keep rerunning, this is the p version. Yeah. You keep rerunning it until you just happen 
to have a couple of lucky subjects that put you over the 0.05 threshold, and then you stop. Well, so that's one, I mean, so that's, uh, so yeah, so yeah, okay, I see. So there you do actually have to rerun the experiment. And so that is costly. Um, okay. But we have whole fields that have no experimental data. Uh, I don't know if they're in psychology department. No, no, they have a zero. You mean data? Yeah, like the finance faculty. Uh, we're all looking at this sort of same data, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, corporations, uh, uh, returns on stocks. And so I mean that, this, this database aspect, so, uh, so David Madigan, did you, do you know about this work? But, oh, oh no, but he, he has this um, meta-analysis of when you're, uh, I, I can't exactly describe what it is, but you know, if you have, um, I guess, biological indicators and diseases or something like that, and you have a database of all these different studies, and you know, you can kind of uh, ask, you can kind of control how you uh, probe the database depending on what you want, what types of covariates you're looking for, things like that. So he has a uh, kind of a meta-analysis of how essentially, you know, you can get a result in, in, either dire in any direction you want for pretty much every disease, depending on how you decide to tune these parameters. Uh, so that's maybe also yeah. related to your point. Yeah. But also, I guess, the, the, the maybe a point that is too, a bit too complicated maybe to even to try to state in a paper, but you know, this doesn't have to be the same p-value, right? I mean, there's a whole field of people who are uh, doing s experiments, right? So it's the question then becomes, you know, it, it's not so much that this particular thing gets in, but if you have so many people trying, some of you know, some of them are going to eventually get in, right? By, by pure chance, um, and I guess then there's also the question of uh, this, this. So I'm also it's assuming here that the prior odds, which is the proportion of true and, f and false null hypotheses, stays fixed after you lower the cutoff. But if it's harder to get published, uh, wouldn't you try out more hypotheses? Or you know, I guess the, one, the other thing is, well, maybe you need to be smarter about how you design your hypothesis. But then, that's the optimistic view. So I don't know what, what's more likely to happen. But I would think that the more hypotheses that you try, the more the better chance you have to get to. Find a good one. Yeah, I mean, you alluded to this. Well, this came up in earlier. You're talking, you were talking about the definition of the of the replication crisis yeah. as being that there are more false findings than there should be approaching. Yeah, I see. And that, that is definitely that's a very kind of neutral way of describing describing it. But, but I mean, I think if you ask the typical psychologist what the what the, the, rep, what the replication crisis is, yeah. it's that a bunch of famous findings have. Um, have been published despite turning out to be unreproducible or have been widely believed despite being un unreproducible. But that, and the reason I bring it up that way is because it centers on a couple of hypotheses that are particularly implausible. Like the most famous example is the ESP experiment by Daryl and Bam, which you know. Okay. No, no, you know that. Yes, but I don't know. But well, this is like, yeah. from, so from my point of view in cognitive psychology, this is the key episode in the replication crisis because it, drew a lot of people's attention to the problem in the statistical techniques. So it basically, in one sentence, an experiment was published by a very famous social psychologist establishing that ESP exists, or that, uh, that was, uh, five years ago. Five years ago? Yeah, um, that, uh, you know, that, that subjects could see the future. They could predict what card was going to turn up on the future card or something like that. And the, I mean, the, the hypothesis was obviously very, very implausible, but the statistics you know, he got a 0.04, I don't know what the actual value yeah. is, but he got a significant finding. And so it was published in a, in a prestigious social psychology journal, and that, and a, a lot of the reaction is to say this epitomizes the problem with p-hacking, uh, with, maybe not with p-hacking, but with, with non hypothesis testing, that, that the only thing that's required to get the community to believe in result is a significant uh, result, as opposed to uh, a hypothesis that's plausible or that relates to known science, as we know, et cetera. And so it drew a lot of attention to the problem. A lot of people who see each other for started a crusade to, to get people to pay attention to these factors, partly as a result of that. So this is something that I don't get into. You know, what, I guess I'm a bit uh, perplexed as to why you why someone would think that. So the problem is with p values, but now let's go to base factors and everything's better. I mean, why can't you hack a, a base factor? Well, that's a fair question. Okay. Um, 
I mean, the problem with p values, the phase factor solved is just the dichotomous quantities that you okay. mentioned before. But it's hard to get people to, to stop being dichotomous. Sure, no, I, I understand that practical issue, but the 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 phase yeah. factors are less dichotomous. Yeah, by definition, the phase factor is continuous. But the p-value yeah. is continuous. Yeah, well. Yeah. I mean, you know, in the old days, you weren't even supposed to report p-values. In my field, anyway, I'm not sure if that was ever really orthodox orthodoxy in statistics, but in, in psychology, you weren't supposed to report p-values. You're just supposed to pick an alpha threshold and then say p less than if it was significant. I see. And not even report the p-value. I mean, as, as recently as when I came into the field, there was still it was very discouraged to report the actual p-value. Well, that kind of gets to Glenn, right? When we're, that's related to what we were talking about before. Well, that was a kind of result of the debate in the 70s. Yeah. Which debate in the 70s? The debate in the 70s about, about Naaman Pearson versus Fisher. That was Naaman Pearson winning out to not report the p-value. It was in the 70s. Yeah, it was in the 30s. Okay. Yeah. 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 But it yeah, culminated exactly. in the seventies. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's when those standards were established. Oh, really? Yeah. I think it probably in the culture they were established. This idea of not reporting p-values. But no, the change yeah, that changed more recent. That's the eighties and nineties. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. The change to reporting p-values was the eighties and nineties. The idea of not reporting them was sort of prevalent from the fifties through the fifties. I thought so. Okay, so now getting to, yes, so this is getting to, what, I guess, what you were bringing up before, which is that I'm, 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 again, I'm taking alpha as the baseline, so H is the relevant at level alpha, H is the current proportion of people who are, or p-values that are being hacked. Pi is this idea of, that I'm calling persistence. It's how persistent these hackers are going to be when the lower cutoff, when we implement the lower cutoff. So some proportion will continue to get below the alpha over C. So alpha over C is, is the new cutoff, which in our case, C is going to be 10. So we've taken uh, 0.05 and we've gone to 0.005. And so the new false positive rate is going to just be of the proportion of hacked p-values that we currently have, the proportion that will continue to be significant at the new level. And you raised the point that this pi by no means needs to be less than one. Uh, you know, you could, what, what, it kind of doesn't have the same interpretation, but it's just that the, the proportion of hacked p-values could go up in, in absolute terms. Um, and, I, and, and actually, so the, I, I mentioned this um, Commentary uh, bot that said to remove rather than yeah. redefine. I think they, they, they actually make that point in their comment, which is that they, they actually would expect p hacking to get worse as a result of this uh, as a result of this uh, change. Okay. So here, if we consider, uh, so here's part of the so here's the, the numbers, the analysis that I'm, I'm running. So I've estimated based on the this is based on this open science. Uh, replication project in psychology. There's 97 studies and um, let's see, 37 percent, 36 out of 97 are, were reproducible, whereas the, um, the theory, so if we would just apply the theory with an alpha level of 0.05, a power of 80 percent, and prior odds of 1 in 10, the theory would predict a reproducibility of 62 percent. Uh, so it's much, much below. But based on applying this, or you know, fitting this more or less a method of moments calculation, I estimated the H to be somewhere to be between 5 and 15 percent. Um, and so here, what are these num What are these lines? So this is the case of where H is 0.05. This is the case of H is 0.15, and you can imagine what happens in between. Um, this is the false positive rate. No, this is the false positive rate at the 0.05 level with h equal to zero. So this is the false positive rate that they are that they're assuming in their figure, uh, 33 percent, 35 or 36 percent or so. This is the false positive rate at the 0.005 level when when h is equal to zero. So this is the drop that they predicted, and it's the same in either case. So it doesn't offend them. It doesn't offend. This is the false positive rate when, uh, at the 0.05 level when H is 0.05. This is the false positive rate when H is 0.15. And this 
curve is the false positive rate as a function of this pi parameter, the proportion of these p values that make it below the new cutoff um, under the 0 0.005 level. So what, this t what, what does this say? So what this says is that, of course, um, oh, and I'm assuming, in all, I'm assuming that the level of the power is 80% before and after the cutoff. And that's an assumption that's, that's a bit of a generous assumption, too, uh, because it's, 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 power certainly isn't going to go up when the significance level uh, is changed. Uh, but assuming that, we can see, well, if we assume that power, improve, power is the same, then there will be an improvement to where we currently stand. It's just that the improvement will not be from here to here. It will be maybe from here to here or something. Uh, but the magnitude of the improvement depends on this issue of how, of how persistent the p-hacking is. And what we can see is that, I mean, I don't know what's a good, uh, what, what is a, you know, I, don't, I think it's unknown. It's not something that's actually measurable in the world we live in, right? Because we would actually have to have a parallel universe where we change the cutoff and see how many of these. So it's not known what, where on this line we would lie. Uh, I think we, can enter, we should entertain possibility that, it's, that we're very high. I mean, it's, very, it's, it's optimistic to think that we would be low, but regardless, uh, that regardless, the false positive rate is considerably higher than, than what they're predicting, I guess. Um, so that's the first. Uh, so that's, that's another observation. The question is, well, is it actually possible that reproducibility could get worse? Well, it certainly is. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, try I'm being as generous as possible by uh, considering, uh, one, that the, the uh, prior odds don't change. And in the previous page, I assumed that the power doesn't change. But if we, if we allow for the power to possibly go down, which is, um, I think, inevitable in a lot of cases. I mean, I don't know. In psychology, I, so I don't know. It depends on how expensive it is to get a higher sample size, uh, right? But I can imagine in some of these studies, if you're dealing with real people uh, who have real jobs uh, and you have to pay them real money, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of, of somebody, you know, like a sleep study or something. If you had to have uh, somebody stay in a room for 15 days and you pay. I mean, that's not the situation in psychology. It's usually, it's usually more college students. Yeah. For free, you know. Yeah. Not right. So collecting, doubling your sample size in that case would be Plus, hard. Wouldn't be our cost to some time. It doesn't cost right. But I guess uh, I saw a complaint uh, by, by another psychologist, and she studied things like, uh, I think, maybe childhood psychology or pediatrics, things like that. And there, as she was saying, that it's not really going to be possible to double the sample size. Oh, yeah. um, so. Infants and toddlers, Right. So, um, one thing I, I just want to. Get, get mentioned is that they claim, based on the empirical evidence, that the replication rate would double based on the based on the study. But we see that, well, it would double under a very optimistic situation, which is if maybe if this pi is less than if less than 15 percent of hacked p values make it to the lower cutoff. Uh, in, in this case, where it, if if h is five percent, and it would double. If about 40 percent, in about 40 percent of the cases here, assuming that power doesn't drop. So, if power does drop, then it would double, and you know, it, it, would, it would need to. Things would have to be much more, much. We'd have much lower persistence. Um, and if power, you know, for example, if power were, were to fall to 50 percent, which is very low, I mean, maybe that's a bit extreme. But just to look, if power were, were to fall to 50 percent, and this persistence were to be somewhere above. 75%, then we could be anywhere from a 19% improvement to a 19% uh, decline in reproducibility. So it's quite, uh, it's quite possible. I mean, the range of possibilities are much, you know, there's a much wider range of possibilities than, than we're led to believe, at least based on what they're, uh, what they're telling us in this, in this paper. So can you tell us more about this open science project? Maybe, I guess. So you know more probably more about it than me, or I have to study. Yeah. No, just. I mean, I I look superficial. The, so the idea the idea is if you if you try to replicate certain experiments, we'll publish your outcomes no matter what. Is that the idea? Uh, so I I don't know. We're talking about the study of the ninety seven. Yeah. So let me, uh, I guess the description is is a simple. They took the maybe three or four of the top journals in psychology. I don't know which ones, and they took 
I don't know how they picked. I mean, there's a lot of questions of how they pick these things, but you're saying they're kind of famous results. Uh, My recollection, I only read superficial accounts, okay. I don't think I've seen the original paper, is that they took famous results, obviously, ranging from super famous, but not a big one, yeah. and just tried to, to reproduce them. Well, these are in these are in, regardless of yeah how famous they're in the top they're in the top journals, but, right? And they reran the experiments. So this was one lab we ran everybody else's experiments, or they? No, I think they did have kind of. They had some cooperative arrangement. Yeah, it was a. Yeah, there are no there's no names on these on this on this uh, paper. It's an open science. What's it called? Open science collective or? or? I'm not sure the connection is between the open science initiative and what you're talking about. Was well, it something they put online? So they didn't get any credit for it as a publication. Open Science Collaboration. It's, it's, it's citation number eight here. Um, open Science Collaboration, it published in Science. Um, it was just a large I see. It was one article published in Science. Yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't like uh, somebody, uh, you know, when you, just from the name, I was imagining, oh, somebody created a journal that said we'll publish anything that replicates a uh, existing article. So there is, a, there is something called the Open Science Initiative, which is different. Okay. Oh. This is just a, a set of protocols for how to publish, how to, how to run studies in a more open way, like pre-registered studies, uh, oh. so that you, you, anyone knows what you're what you set, you set up to test before you yeah. report the results. But you're talking about a particular uh, collective publication. That, uh, I see. Yeah. I don't think it was anonymous. I think it's just a large group. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't. So what is the? How has that worked out? This Open Science Initiative is it any takers? So. Well, that's, that's a whole other discussion. But I mean, it's you know the the idea that it would be good to be more transparent about studies is sort of obvious ethical benefit. But many people, in my part of the field, including myself, have the reaction that if we had to pre-register our studies, we would have to close our labs because. Because the entire process of science is exploratory, and yeah. it's not like a drug trial where we're going to do a very well, carefully, a carefully designed study of whether this drug works. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to pull around until we figure out what the hell's going on, and then we're going to find a study that crystallizes and publish that. And that that is it's not hard to see this relationship between that and PNAC, but but that is the, the practice of science. You don't know what you're doing until you do it, and you, and you don't know how things are going to come out. So there is a lot of um, a lot of sort of meandering through hypothesis space before you publish. So, so a lot of people are opposed to the open science issue. So what would, uh, I, I would, I'm changing the subject, so maybe I should let you finish. That's fine. I mean, there's only a few slides left, so you, we, it's up to you. Well, go ahead. Then I'm, okay. I, 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 so I will, let's see, what do I have here? So this is just, this is just wrapping up. So uh, they, they, the, the, the um, so again, so what my, my main, uh, I guess, gripe with this, uh, which I think is a valid gripe given, as we, we talked about at the beginning, Given the uh, names of people on this on this paper and the influence that they have, is that the analysis really is kind of I guess the claims that they're making about the benefits of this proposal are a bit uh, well, a bit misleading I would say. Uh, they they do say that the they, they believe so they believe that a leading cause of non-reproducibility has not yet been addressed and that that's the stand, low standard of evidence and that they used to. To argue why this is a low standard of evidence, they use the base factor argument, but they also um, argue uh, in terms of this false positive rate being very high uh, under the default 0.05 cutoff. Um, but there is the possibility that reproducibility would de would actually go down under this, and, and several people believe that it would under under this um, lower cutoff. So it must not be that the cutoff itself is what's causing the, uh, the reproducibility issues. It must be a lot of other things. Must, there must be a lot of other things involved. I think we know what those things are. Um, they, they do say that the false positive rate would uh, reduce you know, as low as 5%, but that's, that's assuming that there is no p-hacking, and, and more realistic if the number is somewhere probably between, well, being, being optimistic, 20% 20, 20 up. Uh, and that they, they, did, they do say, based on this, the replication rate would double. And that ignores, that completely ignores this, this issue that we talked about here, which is kind of obvious once you think about it. Um, OK. Uh, let's see. So I guess I, I, I want to make, I do want to comment that they do uh, have a section at the end, which is potential objections to their proposal. And they try to preempt this, this issue, which is that they, the potential objection is that they do not address 
these arguably bigger problems be happening. And they say that, you know, they agree these are bigger problems, but they say that their lower p-value threshold is complementary to these other efforts. And I think that the fact that the reproducibility might actually get worse under their proposal is an argument against this complementary uh, nature. It's not clear that this is complementary unless it's actually being put into play uh, kind of in coordination with these other proposals. Um, this was a response, okay, so uh, the next slide I will say, so you mentioned Wagenmachers, who runs a blog, I don't know if you know this blog, you, you start the, called the Bayesian Spectacle, uh, and it is quite a spectacle. Um, and so he, um, so he was arguing against, um, so we did talk about this paper that I posted uh, last week, which, which outlines these ideas. And he doesn't actually address anything I say, um, he calls me Freddy. Uh, they're, they're trying to be funny, right? Uh, but so he, he doesn't actually address anything that I say. So he says that, um, you know, let's take a closer look at the argument that I give against the analysis that P just below 0.05 is evidentially weak. And they show an empty box uh, because I didn't actually pr present an argument against that. Um, and I didn't present an argument against that. Uh, because I don't uh, see, that's not, that's not really in dispute. But that's also not their main point, so he claims that that's their main point, but remember, the main point is not just that 0.05 is evidentially weak, it's that this evidential weakness is a leading cause of non-reproducibility and that the lower cutoff would immediately improve reproducibility. That's their main point. I mean, this is, um, you know, I, I, quest I do question how this argument could have been published, but I don't even think there's anyone who would, there's really not many people disputing this uh, point. It's, it's the implications of, of what they're saying. Um, and I guess they did, they, I did write a response on their blog, and this was, a, this was a paragraph from it, which was just saying that everything that we've already said, which is that um, they, they try to make, they try to, uh, they're trying to argue that they have a mathematical argument for why the, this l lower cutoff is eventually weak. Um, but then they use that to say something about practice. And all, I, all I'm trying to say, which I think is a, I think is common sense, which is that when you go to say something about reality, reality has to be taken into account. And in this case, the reproducibility crisis is a part of reality. And it's some, and the, the, the uh, the, cause, the leading cause of the reproducibility crisis is, um, at least you know, one of the main uh, causes, is p-hacking. And so I guess the, the analogy that I didn't mention at the beginning was that even, if you're, even though they're not trying to directly combat p-hacking or stop it, they should still control for it in their analysis. It's kind of like if you were doing an, a, a study on lung cancer, the effects of you know, maybe pollution on lung cancer, and you don't control for cigarette smoke. Um, you don't need to be stop. You, they, they, you, you don't need to be trying to stop smoking, stop people from smoking, in order to account for the fact that there is this cause of the issue in, in uh, you know that is very much related to what you're trying to do. Um, but just a technical question, yes. uh, Harry, on there. You put that quote up a couple times. Uh, Which quote? Uh, that one, the one at the top of the slide. Multiple hypothesis testing, publication bias, low power, and other biases, and then p hacking. So yeah, these p hacking. So p hacking is kind of being used as a summary to refer to all those things. To me, but this is written by them. I'm sorry. Do you think they have something more specific in mind when they included that? They mean illicit manipulation of the data in order to accomplish a p hack. But they don't, and that, and, and that multiple hypothesis testing is not in that category. So what is it that's illicit, more illicit than um, selective reporting, measurement error, uh, low power, and multiple hypothesis? What, what else is there? Uh, it's an interesting question. I don't think there's been a study of what people do with the peanut. You know, there's a whole menagerie of tricks that there's a you massage your data. I mean, you can throw away more data. Yeah, you know, just you keep throwing data. You can throw away, away subjects you don't like. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the repeated experiments that I was describing. Well, that's, that's like multiple testing. testing. I know repeated experiments. Yeah, that's not really what. Yeah, that's, that's not good. Really 
So IP hacking here is being used as sort of more pejorative than the other things listed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so multiple hypothesis testing is, I guess, unavoidable in, in some cases. I mean, you, you test multiple hypotheses. It's just a question of whether you Well, that's the exploration he's talking about. But then, I mean, that's, multiple hypothesis testing is at least well discussed in literature. Right? There's all kinds of corrections going back decades that are designed to address it, whereas there hasn't been discussion of p-hacking until very recently. But mm -hmm. they're, they're definitely different. Yeah. Uh, I'm only really using it for so it's linguistic purposes. So always illicit? Well, like I said, it's not always malicious. Yeah, so, so, so you try this, you try that, you try to define your variables in different ways. Yeah. You can measure things in so many different ways. Certainly in this sort of financial uh, field that I was talking about, there's all kinds of ways of defining variables. So you try them out. But uh, the question... Go oh, ahead. No, I mean, I'm, I'm done. You're done. I just... Uh, I just, you know, I, I guess maybe I don't have to say this. I was just kind of uh, reiterating that, um, well, I guess I thought this was interesting, that this is in a human behavior journal. I don't know if this is a known journal. And that it actually ignores a key element of human behavior, which is p-hacking. Um, I also think, yeah, I, I do think it actually provides insight into the, the, the statistical crisis in science because uh, I, do, I do think these arguments that they're putting forward are questionable in their own right. So you have people who are at the forefront of trying to correct the use of statistics, who are, you know, you can see, I, mean, I think it's easy to see uh, whether you think that this is a good argument or not. You can see that there are, there's wiggle room for how you make your argument when you use statistics. And th this, this is very much a, uh, a testament to that. So, you know, I, I, to me, I, I, I'm not so optimistic that this could be resolved by declaring that everybody do this or that, because there's always going to be ways around it, and there's always there's practical issues, like you said. You'd have to close your lab, uh, and and so I mean, the more restrictions, I mean, the, the, they're moving towards more and more restrictions, registered reports, and this and that, to the point where I guess what you talked about, what we talked about before, you're saying, well, why not have everyone describe exactly what they did? Well, that was one of the questions I was going to ask Jacob. You're the only empiricist here, so I'm kind of you know, appealing to you. Well, what really goes on? So that is, so I have two questions for Jacob. And the first one is, do people, is there a, um, is there an outlet that publishes attempts to reproduce? How do we find out about people's? You know, I guess when you hear discussions of, of efforts for that, the yeah. truth is, sociologically, people don't care that much about them. You can't get tenure based on just replicating. Can you even publish your application? Uh, you used to not be able to. And, and because of this ongoing crisis, there is increasing uh, yeah. receptivity to pure replications. And I've seen papers published, not too many, but published in very prestigious journals that were purely failed replications. Failed replications? Yeah, because. So that's now the no, I thought, yes. Well, <laughs> I, mean, but, but I mean, that's the significance of it is, is you know, work that does not look like it's going to replicate. Instead of just failing to replicate it and shutting up about it, Failed to replicate it and saying, look, this work does not replicate. That's newsworthy. You can do that. But you could also, can you, can you publish successful replications? I have never seen an example. Okay. A simple replication? You can. Sorry. In physics, you can. Yeah, in, I think in medicine, you can too. The so famous, famous example was the um, measurements of various constants, for example. Yeah, but I think in some fields of medicine, you can publish. I mean, these are people that publish five articles a week, you know, yeah. uh, so they do replicate what other people do, so let's check this out. That's my impression. That's interesting. No, I, I honestly think it's essentially impossible in psychology to publish a pure replication. You have to at least have some nominal difference that you can make an argument is, is interesting, you know, and it, even if it's approximately replication. So my other question is, Is it, is it conceivable that we could establish a culture in some fields where part of the, where there has to be an appendix to the paper describing the exploratory, modeling the exploratory process? Is it conceivable it's, it's that it's contrary to the sociology of the field? I think that's right. Yeah. So you usually learn so much more about that than you do just from a simple result. In the same way that clean mathematical proofs often hide the uh, footsteps on the way yeah. to the graphic ramp, but, um, but I've never seen anything like that except for some informal comments, very minimal informal comments in papers around the 
a lot of the things they tried before the thing that worked. My question is why, um, I mean, this is a serious question, you know, does it actually matter uh, that results don't replicate in the sense that, um, so if a mathematical proof, I mean, arguably every math, probably, you know, most mathematical proofs in the literature are wrong in some sense. They have mistakes in them. If no, and, and people find these mistakes because they're trying to use the theorem. If nobody ever uses your theorem, then nobody finds a mistake, but what's the difference if nobody's <laughs> paying attention to the theorem? So in science, if nobody's actually, if, if nobody cares about the result that's been found, what's the difference if it's replicable? You know, and yeah. I guess the follow-up to that would be, before you went to build, I guess before you were to go to build on something that was significant, would you try to verify it yourself, or would you just take it and kind of move on? Um, you know, I guess that's the question yeah, I have. One of the ways that this is a, has involved me personally is, in a, in a number of my experimental projects, I've, I've tried to build on a, on a standard finding that was yeah. accepted the field, and I found that I could not replicate the standard finding. Meaning my goal was to, you know, establish sufficient methodology to just find, you know, replicate the result, but then do some twist that I, I was interested in the twist. Yeah. I wasn't interested in the replication. But then this happened to me several times. It simply could not reproduce the well known finding. And so and, so and you you had you couldn't uh, publish that fact or one time I did. One time I basically published a paper that said, you know, this this standard result is only a, we can only obtain it under very, very specified, you know, very narrowly specified conditions. But even then, I don't, we couldn't really publish that paper until we did replicate it, but under, the narrow but, under but under absurdly narrow conditions, and, right. and that that goes that, that cuts our way to heart of the original finding because it's not supposed to be narrow conditions. Those are robust finding, it's not. And did that make some impression? On no, no, no. <laughs> but but I mean, so so this relates to the point that you were making about yeah. whether people know. So so I mean, before when you were talking about the open science paper, the '97 studies. Um, the reason I keep emphasizing that it was really famous studies, it, it's not 97 randomly chosen findings. I mean, the, yeah. the, the replication problem is not just that people publish things that don't replicate um, or publish things that aren't true. If they were, if, if they, um, there, there's a huge interaction with the notoriety of the results. So, so if, uh, if somebody published something in a narrow aspect of psychophysics that was, had a very small community, then they would just, there, there would be no pressure on, for them to publish anything other than what, what they believe to be true. But when people um, are trying to make a splash in a, in a highly societally interested topic, like in some areas of social psychology is the most notorious for this, um, then there seems to be an inverse relationship. The more amazing and urban legendy the result, I mean, the more it immediately spreads to everybody knows it, the, um, you know, the more it tends to be uh, prone to, to unreplicate. And that's, that seems to be the history of the field. So a lot of the center in social psychology, because there was some feeling among the field at large, that all of social psychology seemed to rest on a few famous findings which were not true. Um, I mean, I don't know exactly what was in that study, but one famous example of this is implicit priming, which is this idea that you can figure out people's like racist tendencies. You can't get them to um, to reveal them overtly by asking, you know, do you like black people? But you can get them to implicitly, uh, you know, do it by some pattern of reaction times that they're unaware of. That you, if you show them pictures of black people or white people next to various positive and negative words or stuff, stuff like that. You, you see reaction time differences, which they couldn't possibly have been in control of, but that would yield right. their you know, implicit attitudes. And so there's a whole field of social psychology based on implicit methods like that. And there is some, I'm not an expert at this by any means, but there's some suspicion that the underlying finding is simply a false positive. It's not true. And that not only would that, is that original finding a non replicable but the whole field is basically junk. And that's obviously not widely held opinion within social psychology, but there's some suspicion of that. So it does, all I'm trying to say is it does interact with the theme of the finding. Yeah. So, so I guess some, the, there's yeah. some fields where uh, it does this, where it's still a measure of success to have a false finding and then you get that much more attention to it. <laughs> <you're> like, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, in, uh, in sociology. But so these. So, you know, these famous, these big findings, I mean, would people try, so people would not attempt to reproduce them uh, before they tried to build off them in general, you think? Or? That's a good question. I don't, I don't know. But I mean, you know, there is a long history in science of this intertwined with what you're talking about, but I think it's different, of false replications where people try to replicate a famous finding 
and, and only manage to replicate it with difficulty, but then publish the replication. I mean, uh, Stephen Jay Gould had this example of a, of a measurement of a, of a mass of a proton or something. Mm -hmm. It was first done by Magnuson and Morgan or somebody in the 19th century. And they got some value, and then, um, and then uh, Gould plotted, have you ever seen this? He plotted the subsequent estimates of the value of this physical concept oh, yeah. over the decades. And the, the estimates gradually declined. And they approached the modern true value, which is known, to, which is you know, uh, obtained by much more sophisticated methods. But the problem was that the original estimate was way off. But people didn't think it could be that way off because it was a famous scientist who had discovered it. And so they they would pre-hack, or that's, it wasn't literally yeah, pre-hack yeah, because yeah. it's adjusting a parameter. But they would adjust their estimates by you know handpicking the data or something to be some at least somewhat close to his original finding. And that pressure to do that diminished over the years. And so there was a steady change in the supposedly physical constant. Yeah. Over the course of about a century, and you know that that shows what's what's happening here is more difficult than just isn't significant. It seems still that psychological experiments are much harder than physics experiments to control various variables and to really design measurements precisely. In right. physics, there are going to be kind of you know intersubjective objective facts you kind of just observe. Um, in psychology, you have to be lost in indirect measurements. Uh, well, they're, they can be very direct, but they're, they're, I mean, the actual measurements are often reaction times and responses, which are pretty easy to measure. Right? The uncertainty has to come to the logical connection between those and mathematical connections. Right. Between so the model is going to be, there's only lots of gaps to be filled. Yeah. I mean, my impression, I don't know anything about modern physics, but I, my impression is that in physics, there's a huge amount of indirect reasoning between the actual measurement and the interpretation. Right. Um, it's just that there's a lot of history behind all the intervening steps, so that the steps are, are taken with a great deal of confidence because there's a ton of theory and experiment. Well, I mean, the original experiments in physics, like observational experiments, like planetary motions, yeah. and you cannot really hack that. It's calculate based on that. But you can make mistakes. You could, yeah. I mean, you, I mean, Laplace is estimate of the mass of Jupiter is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. That's right. He gave a he gave a million to one odds. I mean when after after Laplace discovered his central limit theorem in the last ten years of his life, he campaigned with all the scientists in Europe writing letters to them about how far his method was. And one of his favorite examples that he wrote to all of all the all of his colleagues across Europe, but one of his favorite examples was that you know, using a central limit theorem, he could calculate with a, a million to one odds that Bouvard's estimate of the mass of Jupiter relative to the sun was within 1% correct. And it wasn't until after he died that it was, you know, that Airy discovered that it's in 2% <laughs> <laughs> error. So that was amazing. That wasn't a p value. That was amazing. <laughs> Or it was a confidence that he was. So I guess at, at but the problem was that sorry. some of Bouvard's data was was uh, had errors in it. Well, so the plus estimate was conditioned on the data. Right? But he didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs>